Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Our Warming Planet webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. Let's give everyone a couple of minutes to join and then we can get started. Thank you. Welcome everyone, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining the Our Warming Planet Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation webinar series. We still have a few people streaming in, but let's get started. We have now come to our 12th bi-weekly webinar, which uh, all started with a book launch this February. So thank you for sticking around with us since then. Today's lecture is from Paula Harrison on cross-sectoral climate change impacts in Europe. And Paula is based at the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. On to the um, first slide, Jen. So let me start by telling you what you can expect today. So we'll have a brief introduction. Um, David and I will uh, run this section. We'll have a little poll to see uh, where all of you are joining from, what you work on. Uh, then we have uh, Paula Harrison delivering her lecture. Then Jen Evans will uh, moderate a live Q&A session. So you'll have the Q&A box where you can send us your questions. And then we'll have a brief wrap up. So today we will end um, right within the hour. So um, it will be uh, one lecture today. And on to the next slide, please. So I want to start by briefly introducing um, the books, book editors. This book is in honor of Martin Parry, who is a pioneer on climate impacts and played a key role in the 2007 IPCC reports. Martin is a visiting professor at the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London. He was co-chair of the IPCC Working Group 2, Impacts, Adaptation and Vulnerability, and a convening lead author in three IPCC assessments. He has been a professor of geography at the University of Oxford, University College London, East Anglia, and Birmingham University in the UK. Cynthia Rosenzweig is a senior research scientist at Columbia University's Center for Climate Systems Research and at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, where she leads the Climate Impacts Group. She co-founded the Agricultural Model into Comparison and Improvement Project, AGMIP. She was a coordinating lead author for several IPCC assessments as well. Cynthia was named one of nature's 10 people who mattered in 2012. And she's a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship. And in May 2022, that's just this year, Cynthia was awarded the World Food Prize. And on to the next slide, please. David Rind is the series editor. So David's been involved in all of the uh, Our Warming Planet books. David is a senior NASA research emeritus at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And for more than 30 years, he was a climate research scientist for NASA, as well as an adjunct professor at Columbia University teaching graduate level courses in climate dynamics and atmospheric dynamics. He has more than 300 publications related to climate and climate change, is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and is a recipient of many awards, including co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize as a lead author on IPCC. That was the IPCC assessment both Cynthia and Martin were uh, involved in as well. On to the next slide, please. Actually, we'll leave this slide. Uh, and David, oh, over to you to talk a little bit about the series and then uh, also to introduce uh, some of the topics of the current book. Yes, so as you can see, uh, there are three books shown on this slide. And these web this webinar series is associated with the middle book our warming planet, climate change impacts and adaptation. Uh, as you probably understand by now, for those who've been here previously, these books are not the typical textbooks. What they include are approximately 20 to 25 topics 
on the particular subject at hand. The, each topic is covered with about five pages of text. And then there are 20 slides. Online, there are effectively PowerPoint slides that can be downloaded for uses in classes or just general talks to people. The, the whole point of this series is to allow people to communicate and exchange information associated with these different topics. The first one, as you can see, being topics in climate dynamics, more like working group one of IPCC. The second one, obviously, the one we're discussing now on impacts and adaptation, which is like working group two. And the forthcoming book, which will be out in October, just a month from now, studies of cloud convection and precipitation associated with satellite observations. So uh, again, these webinars are associated with the books. They're given by the authors of the individual chapters. So you not only can get from the book information that these, chapter, these authors are willing to impart, but you'll hear from the authors themselves and can pick up additional information and subtleties. Back to you, Natasha. Uh, Thank you. Next slide, please, Jen. So this is an overview of the topics and authors um, of uh, the current book that uh, David mentioned. And uh, a lot of, we have now gone through a lot of these. So you will be able to, if you haven't managed to catch it live, we will um, paste in the chat where you can find the recordings. And then at the end, we'll tell you what's upcoming as well. On to the next slide, please. So those of you who have joined us before, you know how this, uh, this goes. This is just a short poll um, to um, see, um, to get to know all of you. So let me launch the poll. So the first question is to get a sense of where you are joining us from today. We usually have a pretty good, uh, we pretty, we have pretty good representation from all regions, but um, sometimes uh, the time zone doesn't work for all regions as well. So, so we've got more than 86% of the audience participating, which is fantastic. Let's give it a few more seconds and then I'll end the poll and uh, share results. So today it looks like North America is, uh, dominating the audience uh, but, but we do have a little bit of participation from other regions so it does vary each each uh, each session now let's see uh, which sector you uh, you work in so sometimes we have um, representation from all sectors sometimes um, you know it it really does vary based on uh, based on the day Great, great. So we have over 80% of the audience that have participated. So this is great. Give it a few more seconds and I'll share the results. So this is fantastic. We have uh, a lot of sectors being represented today. This is fantastic. And then the final question, is your involvement in climate change work? And as with the other questions, we typically have uh, people joining uh, who are you know, involved in various aspects of climate change work and some uh, want to know, want to learn more, which uh, these lectures are ideal for. Once again, we have over 80% of the audience that have participated in this, which is fantastic. So I will, um, in the poll, share the results. So this is really fantastic. We see that, you know, a lot of the people work directly, but there's also a range here. So this is great. Welcome and thanks for joining us. And, um, you know, as we get, started uh we would also like to get to know you um on 
on a more individual basis. So if you wish to share uh, your information, so you can start introducing yourself in the chat as we progress and you can share as much information or as little information as you like. So you can include your name, country, institution, role, email, and even how you think this book might uh, help you. Let me paste that in the chat as well so that um, you can um, start introducing yourself. And um, let's move on to uh, the next slide, please, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, for being here today. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Harrison, who is a professor of land and water modeling and principal natural capital scientist at the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. She's also co-director of the Center for Environmental Data Science, a joint center between UKCEH and Lancaster University. Her research specializes in working across disciplines to integrate different types of knowledge using both modeling and participatory approaches to support stakeholder-led climate change vulnerability and adaptation assessment. She has widespread experience in development and application of different types of simulation models for investigating the impacts of climate and socioeconomic change, particularly for agriculture, biodiversity, and land use. She has also led the integration of land and water models to assess interdependencies, synergies, and trade-offs, as well as investigating uncertainty propagation within such integrated modeling frameworks. She also studies the relationship between natural capital and ecosystem services to improve the understanding of sustainable management of the natural environment. Martin Perry uh, had a message for uh, Paul as well. He was hoping to join, but he was unfortunately stuck on a train and couldn't get home on time. Uh, he said uh, um, that uh, he's very proud that from starting as a graduate student in about 1990 at Birmingham University in the UK, she has built a reputation as the leading researcher on climate change impacts and adaptation in Europe. So it's wonderful to have you today, Paula. Uh, you can start sharing your screen whenever you're ready and uh, we look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Manishka, and uh, thank you for the lovely message from Martin Parry as well. That was uh, very much appreciated as uh, it was a pleasure to uh, participate in the book, given that Martin uh, gave me my first research position as a very young scientist in the early 1990s. Um, so um, I am assuming you can see my screen fine, Manishka. Yes, I can. Yes, Paula, yes. Please go ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you. OK, so. So my lecture is going to be looking at uh, climate change impacts in Europe, um, and I'm going to be doing this particularly through a cross-sectoral lens, so focusing on what are some of the interactions and independences between different sectors as they're affected by climate change. So I just want to start by uh, just providing a little bit of background to the topic, and some of you will be very familiar with this background. Um, so, as, as many of you might know, changes in climate are likely to have widespread environmental and socioeconomic impacts, and those impacts are likely to be greater when they're associated with uh, higher levels of warming. Um, and the Paris Agreement, uh, that states that climate change should be limited to well below two degrees above pre-industrial pre levels, and that countries should strive to limit that increase in temperatures to 1.5 degrees. However, as many of you will be aware, current greenhouse gas emission trends suggest that limiting warming to the two degrees target might be difficult to achieve. And whilst we now have 129 countries that have made net zero pledges of emissions reductions, only 59 of those countries have actually enacted those pledges in law or in policy. And without really significantly increased action, uh, higher greenhouse gas emissions could increase global temperatures by over four degrees uh, above pre-industrial pre levels by the end of this century. So it's really, really important that uh, researchers are able to provide evidence um, at, that's reliable and timely for people to be able to manage those impacts of climate change and to help support climate change adaptation and mitigation action. 
So my presentation focuses on Europe, um, and Europe is a very diverse continent. Uh, it ranges from sort of the subarctic climate in the north in Scandinavia to a very hot and dry Mediterranean climate in southern Europe. We also have a very uh, wide range of land uses. We have lowland plains, we have high mountains, and we have a mix of land use, which is from um, expanding urban areas through to intensive arable and horticultural land, through to very extensive upland grazing and forestry systems. So climate change is likely to have very different impacts across different parts of Europe and on different social and economic sectors, on human health, on ecosystems and all the goods and services that they provide to us as humans. Uh, however, what I really want to stress in this lecture is that those actual impacts of climate change really depend on how socioeconomic and political changes happen at the same time as those climate change this is quite uncertain. We don't know how they will change, but what we do know is they're very unlikely to stay the same as currently. Um, and in addition to that, I also want to stress that actually any climate change impacts on one particular sector are very likely to be conditioned on how those sectors interact with other sectors. So how can we start to take account of some of that complexity between those uh, cross-sectoral interactions? So just to go to, into that in a little bit more detail um, and to try and introduce um, what we call integrated modeling approaches. So here we have uh, a number of sectors, urban, agriculture, forest, coast, water and biodiversity. And we know that those sectors, they compete first for land. They also compete for water resources. And there are also um, interactions between those sectors in how they're impacted by climate change. So, for example, uh, changes in land use due to climate change, they affect, for example, regional hydrology, and they also affect uh, species uh, for biodiversity. Furthermore, when we implement uh, climate change adaptation strategies, if we're not aware of these cross-sectoral interactions, they can result in unintended consequences for another sector. So, for example, if you're implementing sort of hard measures uh, for coastal flood events, they can affect uh, coastal habitat for, the, for important or protected species. Uh, but what we know from a lot of research is that many climate change impact assessments have applied models of individual sectors, so for agriculture, forestry or water systems, without considering some of those complex independences and interactions that take place in our human and environmental systems. And it's becoming increasingly recognised that systemic approaches are needed to address environmental problems such as climate change. And hence integrated modeling approaches have been developed that try and move away from this sectoral view to recognizing the importance of cross-sectoral interactions. So I'm gonna mainly focus on research that's come from a um, project that was funded by the European Union um, that was known as the Impressions Project. And this um, examined the implications for Europe of future changes both in climate and in social and economic drivers, and it took an integrated modelling approach. What it aimed to do was advance science on the consequences of um, climate change that was at a higher end. So if we were missed, we were able to, if we if we missed the Paris Agreement targets of 1.5 or 2 degrees, then what were the likely impacts going to be across Europe? And in the project, we applied more than 20 impact models across global. Uh, European and regional and local scales to provide useful cross-sectoral information for decision makers who had responsibility, particularly for designing climate change adaptation and development strategies. And so what I'm going to focus on here in, in my lecture is some of the uh, European scale uh, modelling results that came from this project. Um, and if you're interested in further information, though, there is a link to the website at the bottom of this slide. So just to uh, just provide a very brief overview of the, the main integrated assessment model that we used in this project, which, which is known as the Impressions Integrated Assessment Platform. Um, and this um, slide shows a simplified flow diagram of that platform for Europe. And the ellipses in the slide, they represent the 11 models that are within the platform. And then the arrows between those ellipses, they represent how we pass data between those models. And those past data passes represent various biophysical or socioeconomic independences between the sectors. So for example, if we 
uh, start here with the urban model that produces data on the location and area of different artificial surfaces, which is simulated. That's passed to a hydrological model because that then affects um, the um, hydrological regime and the demand for water. It is also passed to the flooding model because it affects the uh, population that is exposed to flood risk. Uh, the urban um, area also acts as constraint on the area that's available for agricultural and forestry and for rural land use. And it also affects um, biodiversity in terms of species and habitat suitability. So this slide here just tries to show um, in a very broad overview uh, how the importance of capturing some of those cross-sectoral linkages and independences within the Impressions Integrated plat uh, Assessment Platform and how this gives a more comprehensive understanding of the implications of climate change and socioeconomic change for Europe. So don't worry too much about the detail here because I'm gonna zoom into uh, the different results uh, in the following slides. But here, basically what we can start to see is that future socioeconomic changes such as changes in population increases or in economic growth uh, they'll lead to the need for new housing and new industry, which leads to increased urbanization. That can change uh, demand for water supply and for food. Um, and it also affects agricultural di uh, agriculture directly through the loss of land. Um, and also th through um, increased competition for limited uh, water supply, which potentially limits the uh, water that is available for irrigation in some areas. Uh, that suitability for land can also be constrained by changing flood risk due to climate change and sea level rise, uh, with uh, frequently flooded land becoming unsuitable for intensive farming. Uh, and we also see that changes in agricultural land use um, across Europe can then um, affect uh, different land uses, such as forest areas um, and ultimately different habitats. Um, and that affects then the suitability of those habitats for species. So just before I start zooming in on to the different sectors and look at some of the impacts, I just want to introduce the, the scenarios that we used in this project. And again, here, there are two types of scenarios. So on the left-hand side, there is a set of climate change scenarios. And on the right-hand side, there's a, check, check, a set of scenarios that are related to changes in social and economic conditions. So first, if we look on the left-hand side of the slide, this shows the uh, set of climate change scenarios that we used. They were based on three emissions pathways from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they're known as the Representative Concentration Pathways or the RCPs. And here we used uh, three different ones, RCP 2.6, 4.5 and 8.5. And for each of these emissions scenarios, we have three combinations of global climate models and regional climate models, and that's allow us to represent some of the uncertainty over future climate projections in Europe. And then if you look at these maps here, you can sort of see the, the, the broad changes in uh, mean annual temperature that we were considering sort of range from around about um, 1.5 degrees under the 2.6 scenario up to about 5 degrees under the RCP 8.5 scenario, and that's relative to a baseline of 1961 to 90. Moving to the right hand side of the slide, this is to capture potential interactions between climate change and future socioeconomic conditions. We have a set of four socioeconomic scenarios, and these are based again on a set of scenarios used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change research community known as the Shared Socioeconomic Pathways. And we use the scenarios that are numbered one three, four, and five. And these SSPs, uh, they describe alternative tra tra trajectories of future socioeconomic development, and they focus on uh, challenges to climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. So just running through these quickly in a sort of clockwise manner from the top left, SSP one here, this represents a sustainable and cooperative society with a low carbon economy and a high capacity to adapt to climate change. Then if we move to SSP4, uh, this scenario here represents a world where power becomes much more concentrated in a relatively small political and business elite. Uh, and that elite facilitates low carbon economies, 
but there are very large differences in income across society and high inequality that limits adaptive capacity of the general population. If we move down here to SSP3 in the bottom right, this is a highly dy dystopian future where the world becomes increasingly fragmented uh, with very uh, poor um, economic conditions and a lot of regional conflicts leading to a dis disintegration of social fabric and many countries that are struggling to maintain living standards. And then finally, moving over to the left bottom here on SSP5, this is a very technologically advanced world with a very strong economy, but it's uh, very heavily dependent on fossil fuels. Um, so it has very high, associated with high climate change, but with a population that has a high capacity to adapt. Uh, what those scenarios sit with in this integrated assessment platform, um, and the platform has an interface where um, the user can run the different climate and socioeconomic scenarios uh, to explore their own um, cross-sectoral impacts for Europe. So basically the user can uh, select a time slice here at the top, which is either 2020s, 2050s or 2080s. They can um, uh, select their emissions scenario. So as I've just introduced, that's RCP 2.6, 4.5 or 8.5. Then they can select their climate model and their socioeconomic scenario. Um, and then uh, you can also manipulate your socioeconomic scenarios using the different sliders up behind here. So actually, if you believe that uh, behavioral changes in terms of either water savings or dietary preferences you might want to explore something that was different. You can change those um, assumptions behind those scenarios. The color coding in green is showing that that is sort of within the uncertainty range of the socioeconomic scenario, but the user can actually move into the yellow range, which can be used to create your own socioeconomic scenarios, uh, which you then can uh, run the model um, and use it to um, explore different maps of outcomes uh, for over 90 different sectoral and ecosystem-based output indicators. Uh, and I'm just gonna, in the next uh, few slides, just take you through some of the outputs that come from this modeling platform run under these different combined climate and socioeconomic scenarios. So this first um, slide uh, looks at urban development under the four uh, socioeconomic scenarios, the SSPs, and here we can see, if you first look at SSP5 here on the right uh, hand side, uh, here we've got very high population growth of 47%. And this is coupled with very lax planning policy and increases in wealth and preferences for single living and larger properties. And that leads to a doubling in the area of artificial surfaces across Europe. And that's so it changes, um, urban areas change from 4% of the land area today to 99% in 2100. Um, and this level of urban sprawl that observed in this scenario is a really serious threat to Europe's sustainable urban agenda. In, con on, in contrast, if we move right to the left-hand side of the slide and look at SSP1, in here we've got lower population growth in the assumptions of this scenario. And also society is shifting to more sustainable compact urban development um, and a very large proportion of people living in cities with good access to public transport and other services. And here artificial surfaces are uh, simulated to remain at their current levels of 4% in, um, in, in across Europe. Uh, the other two scenarios, SS3 3 and SSP4, they uh, feature quite high, both of them feature quite high levels of inequality, uh, weak spatial planning and governance, um, and quite low levels of environmental or social awareness. And that poor urban planning leads to the emergence of sort of more like urban ghettos with social challenges, including unemployment, crime, and segregation. Um, and they result in a low coping capacity um, and a high vulnerability to climate change. Um, and we have policy briefs on the Impressions website and the links are at the bottom of the slide. Again, if anyone wants some more further uh, information on all of the slides, I'm just about to show you. So if we move on and look at flood damage. So flood damage is highly dependent also on socioeconomic factors such as population and urban development, as well as climate change. So again, here I'm just showing SSP1, which was combined with um, 
a climate change scenario based on RCP 4.5, which is sort of a mid-level climate change, and SSP 5 combined with higher climate change under RCP 8.5. So here again on the right hand side under SSP5, we see the, the extensive urban sprawl I showed in the previous slide that creates very large areas that are vulnerable to flooding. And because this scenario is also combined with higher levels of climate change together, these result in estimated damages from a one in 100 year flood event growing from $78 million today to $1,800 billion in the 2080s. And that affects an ex means an extra 15 million people in Europe are affected by flooding. Whereas if you look at the more sustainable SSP1 scenario, where we have a compact urban development and slightly lower climate change, again, we still get increases in flood damage, but they're restricted to um, around 490 million um, euros. Uh, moving to uh, look at the agricultural sector, here again, climate change is projected to vary dramatically across Europe. Um, and often we see in from many of the climate models that Southern Europe becomes hotter and drier and Northern Europe becomes warmer and wetter. And that tends to lead to increased drought severity, water scarcity and heat stress um, in some of the Mediterranean parts of, of um, Northern Europe, which can lead to crop stress and failure. And that heat stress is uh, particularly likely to increase for livestock and poultry, reducing milk yields, egg production and weight, and weight gain. Whereas in Northern Europe, again, by contrast, we might see um, that agricultural production is increased. It's boosted by the warmer temperatures, it has a longer growing season and potentially also by a CO2 fertilization effect. But that often depends on appropriate adaptation being implemented. Uh, so as a result of those kinds of changes, we see that agricultural systems are expected to shift northwards. So on this slide, this shows um, the change in intensive arable land. Uh, and here we can sort of see that arable farming tends to increasingly concentrate in the northeast of um, Europe, whilst the intensive livestock farming moves more to the northwest. Um, and the, uh, the effects on agriculture are strongly influenced, again, also by socioeconomic factors. So if we look again at the SSP1 scenario, which is more sustainability focused, this scenario has reduced food imports and less use of agrochemical imports, which means that it's, it's difficult for yields to increase and they're actually assumed to slightly decrease. Uh, so combined with the climate change, changes in climate, this leads to arable land expanding slightly compared to today. And this is at the expense of sort of some of the unmanaged land or some of the forests. Whereas in SSP5 um, scenario, this is much more resource intensive um, and it has much more higher um, inputs, artificial inputs applied to the land. And here we can see the potential crop inputs are assumed to significantly increase due to technological improvements. But also there are very significant increases in food imports in this scenario. And because of those increases in food imports, uh, the area needed for arable crops within Europe shrinks quite significantly compared to the baseline. But that is mainly because, again, Europe is offsetting its food input in footprint to other parts of the world in that scenario. So those changes in agriculture will indirectly also affect water stress uh, due to different demands for irrigation for growing crops. Uh, and again, that varies under the different climate and socioeconomic scenarios. So under the more environmentally focused uh, scenario of SSP1 here, we've also got efficient water use technologies and water saving behavior by the population, which also reduces pressure on water resources. Um, and also society has a much better um, ability to cope with water stress and hence vulnerability to water stress is reduced uh, relative to SSP5, which is a resource intensive scenario where adapting to climate change is much more challenging when we start to see really severe vulnerability to water scarcity. Uh, and then it starts to extend across much of Europe and particularly uh, severe water stress is anywhere that is orange or uh, red in the slide, which is particularly over much of Europe in the um, map on the right hand side. 
So how might that then affect biodiversity? Um, so a warming climate will force uh, many species to shift northwards or to higher altitudes or to stay and adapt to new conditions or perhaps even just become extinct. And survival for many of those organ organisms will depend on how they can disperse, uh, the suitability of other available habitats and the presence of uh, connected, ha connected habitat networks that enable that migration. So in the Impressions project, we model the availability of suitable climate space for 111 species. These were a combination of different plants, birds, insects, mammals, and amphibians. Uh, and we selected them to represent different habitats, so farmland, grassland, forests, wetlands, and heathlands, um, as well as different Mediterranean alpine regions. Uh, and what we can see that these impacts vary really strongly across Europe. In Southern Europe, the hotter and drier conditions, which are associated with higher level of climate change, they can lead to ma really major habitat transformations and severe impacts on biodiversity. So in Northern Europe, we also see that some species, they, they may be able to adapt or gain access to new areas, but that also really depends often on um, some adaptation plans and some management uh, being uh, put in place to help those species to move. Um, and then on this slide, it, it summarizes some of those overall land use changes in Europe and how they're projected to change under the different combined climate and socioeconomic scenarios. And again, here under the more environmentally focused SSP1 scenario, where we've got increasing populations, reducing food imports, and a shift to low input farming practices we see here an increase in land area for arable and livestock farming to meet Europe's food demands. So that's the yellow and green areas are increasing. Um, and that agricultural expansion is at the expense of forests and woodland that begin to decline. Whereas in contrast, under the SSP5 scenario here, the promotion of really intensive, high yielding technolo technology driven farming means that more food can be produced from a smaller land area. Uh, so we see, again, the area of intensive and extensive farming declines, and that free ups land then that can be dedicated to, um, to manage an unmanaged forest. But again, as I mentioned before, it's really important to know that that relies on greater food imports, dis potentially displacing greenhouse gas emissions and possible habitat degradation to other parts of the world. Uh, so again, just want to summarize in this slide, what are some of the benefits of this integrated modeling approach rather than actually modeling each of those sectors independently. Uh, and this is summarized in this slide where we quantified uh, the differences between running the 11 models that sit within the impressions integrated assessment platform independently or combined within the platform under a very wide range of scenarios. And what you can see here is that we see significant differences in the magnitude of change. So that's the coloring. So anything that is colored uh, green, light green or dark green shows that there is a difference of more than 50% in the simulated magnitude of change in some of those output indicators. Um, and there are also cases where we actually get to predict a different direction of change uh, if we are using uh, single sector models rather than an integrated model. And those are shown by those the uh, double headed arrows. And again, this really depends um, on how different output indicators are related to others. Uh, so, for example, you can see for the urban area, there's no difference here because we are assuming in the model that um, urban, air, urban development takes precedence over any other sector. So it isn't affected by interactions from the other sectors. Whereas those related more to agriculture and biodiversity are very highly affected by competition for land and for water and by those cross sectoral interactions. So just within the final part, I just want to very quickly show an example of how we've used um, this modeling approach to look at adaptation strategies. Um, and again, here we I'm just going to show an example where we've looked at a range of um, adaptation strategies that have different aims, so they might focus on self-sufficiency or on behavioral change. Um, this slide again is showing just some examples where they might focus on options related to trade, such as reducing imports to become more self-sufficient in food, technological change, such as improving water use efficiency or irrigation efficiency, behavioral changes such as dietary change or policy changes such as through agri-environment schemes or protected areas. So ultimately can be 
very difficult to devise adaptation strategies that might have no unintended consequences or trade-offs. But again, using this integrated modeling approach, you can start to reveal some of the types of trade-offs that can occur under different strategies and to highlight some of those political and societal choices that are going to be needed to either deal with or minimize some of those trade-offs. So in this slide here, we've got uh, the different adaptation strategies um, and we're showing um, in the different boxes in the slide. Um, and what we show here is um, we've got um, two columns for climate change scenarios here, one extreme and one moderate. And we've got two socioeconomic scenarios along this row here, one more utopian and sustainable and one more dystopian and sort of fragmented and high intensive use scenario. Um, and if you look, really just focus on sort of the orange and the green colors in the slide, you can see, for example, that strategies that focus on improving food self-sufficiency, uh, they lead to positive changes in food production, obviously. Here in this first column here, we've got the green arrow, but again, they, they can lead to quite negative changes uh, for water resources, for timber production, um, and for ad atmospheric regulation through carbon sequestration. Alternatively, adaptation strategies that based on either maximizing timber or nature, again, they may lead to sort of more negative impacts on producing food that ne need to be dealt with, but more positive effects on other ecosystem services, such as your land experience and recreation, the diversity of the land um, and for forest and uh, nature conservation. So just to conclude, um, what, what we try to show with this work, again, is that uh, to provide sort of reliable science-based information uh, to decision makers uh, on climate change impacts, it's really important to um, recognize that both socioeconomic and political changes will continue and they might interact with climate change in potentially complex ways. Um, and that though, but also those changes are likely to lead to amplified independences between different land and water based sectors. Uh, so we're really thinking that integrated modeling and scenario studies build some understanding of those independences between the sectors and allow us to explore some of the responses that might be more robust to uncertain futures across the different sectors. Um, and that highlights then the importance of developing adaptation plans that are robust to both changes in climate and socioeconomic pathways and that take account of some of those cross-sectoral action interactions. And then just with my final slide, I just want to sort of say that um, in the case of Europe, we found that climate change impacts vary uh, greatly across Europe. We have some regions that benefit um, and some that where we see very detrimental effects. Uh, but this means that we need actually concerted action across all sectors um, and a, a range of different spatial scales to implement appropriate adaptation and mitigation strategies. And that means that also we need to strengthen society's capacity to cope with climate change, as well as try taking action to uh, reduce climate change itself and taking using a systems based perspective for developing those action plans will allow us to exploit synergies and minimize trade-offs across the different sectors. But that does require coordination and the relevant governance mechanisms to do that, that bring together governments, civil society and business. So with that, I'd just like to thank you very much for your attention and a big acknowledgement to the many project partners and stakeholders that were involved in this research that uh, I have presented to you. So I will end there um, and thank you again. Thank you so much, Paula, for that fantastic lecture. This seems to be very advanced integrated modeling. And uh, I think, you know, based on what you showed us, including sort of the analysis you did on trade-offs and everything, it looks uh, very useful for adaptation planning and strategies. So definitely uh, a lot, I think we can all learn from this approach. Thank you. Um, Next, uh, it's over to Jen Evans, who's a graduate research assistant at the Center for Climate Systems Research. Uh, Jen will moderate the Q&A session. Over to you, Jen. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it looks like we already have um, some questions coming in, but if anyone else has questions, feel free to, um, to use the Q&A function and we'll try to get through them. Um, but I will 
jump right into it so that we can get to as many as possible. Um, so the first question from Stevie Leonard Harrison um, says, could you provide some insights if the modeling and scenario are applied to other regions such as Asia and Africa due to the huge gap with Europe advanced progress on climate and urban development despite the betterment happening in Asia for achieving their climate target and better urban sustainability? Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Stevie, for your question. So um, if I'm interpreting it correctly, I, I'm assuming you're asking if, if similar sort of integrated modelling approaches have been used in Asia and Africa. Um, I know we've certainly worked with some countries in Asia, so we've worked quite a lot with, uh, with Taiwan and Korea, who have actually, um, they came along to quite a lot of our meetings during the Impressions Project because they were developing similar integrated assessment platforms for their countries. Uh, I also know Japan has also been working on similar integrated modeling studies, uh, looking at the impacts of climate change. I, I don't really know any of Africa, like poor Africa or different countries in Africa. It doesn't mean they don't necessarily exist, but I'm certainly not aware of them. Uh, there is certainly um, a lot of work taking place in with global integrated assessment models, but that does then really simplify the spatial resolution that is possible to achieve than if you're going down to sort of regional or national scales. Um, and, and certainly what this work in Europe uh, has led to in the UK is a sort of a demand for government now where we're developing similar platforms either for the UK or for England and Wales to help sort of inform new policy design uh, that, that tries to ensure that there's not an unintended consequences for trying to achieve different aspects of moving towards a more sustainable future. Thank you. Um, so I see Joel is on the line uh, in in our panel as well and had a question. Um, so do, do you wanna speak out your question, Joel? Sure, well, this is uh, brilliant, Paula. And, and it's, it's, I wanna dive in and, and start reading your work because it's a lot to absorb. And it's, and I'm sure challenging to present too, because you're dealing with so many, so many moving parts. And um, I have a number of questions, but one I have is in terms of what you're measuring is the um, uh, using to assess uh, the effects. So, so you've, you've done a very good job of capturing a lot of, you know, ecological, environmental outputs uh, or outcomes. Um, I'm curious about economic outcomes. Have you uh, integrated this with you know, uh, such measures as total GDP, GDP per capita, distribution of wealth, percentage, percentage in poverty, those kind of uh, outcomes, and, and particularly looking at the effects of the different scenarios. Yeah, so, so probably the short answer to that is, is no, but it's something we're really interested to do. Uh, and I know there is a lot of interest in sort of moving in that direction. So, so the furthest we've really got so far is... Um, if you look within sectors, uh, we some of the models can do things like look at farm business income and how that might change mm -hmm. under the different scenarios. So, so we can get towards some of those types of indicators, but we haven't really expanded it at the minute much beyond that. But there is there's quite an interest now in, in, in trying to look at some of those more economic indicators and also then sort of feedbacks, particularly again, if you're seeing very detrimental impacts on biodiversity and natural capital, again, is there a sort of mm -hmm. a tipping point that feeds back to the economic system. So again, that's an area really interested in. It adds in yet another layer of complexity on something that's already complex, but be really interesting <laughs> to look at. Okay, thank you. Um, and so from Thomas Brewer uh, asks, can you revise your projections, at least informally and impressionist impressionistically on the basis of the floods and fires in Europe in 2021 and 2022? So yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, so certainly not easy with the modeling platform that I presented today, because it's uh, quite a lot of work to, to update the baseline. Um, but we have certainly learned from that experience because that project finished in 2018. Um, and the, the modeling platforms were now sort of co-designing with government, we're, we're designing them in a much more flexible way that allows you to much more rapidly adapt and customize them, which could include updating your baseline data to sort of almost run in near real time. But again, that's quite a methodological challenge and has made us really sort of think how you create these kind of integrated models from scratch. The one I presented, because it's quite hardwired, it ends up quite rigid, and then it's quite difficult to respond 
to change it really quickly to look at uh, some current extreme events as they're happening. And a lot of the models are also set up using sort of average data. So they, they, they the flood model, I guess, would 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 probably be able to cope with with it. But may, we don't really do fire so well in the model. So there will be model limitations depending on the component models that are within these systems. Um, but yeah, you right, raise a really interesting question. And I think, again, it's a challenge going forwards to make these kind of modeling systems much more easy for other people to take up and adapt, but also to make them more useful actually for decision makers. And kind of on that note, um, an anonymous attendee is asking, how does one get access to the model to explore the different scenarios? Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, yeah, it's that, that's a bit difficult at the minute because it is it, the, the platform is open access through the interface. You, you won't be able to get to the code, but you can run it. But the problem is we're in the process of updating the interface because it was built to run on Internet Explorer. So if you happen to have, still have or can access Internet Explorer as your browser system, then there is a link to the model interface on the Impressions Project website. Um, and anyone can go and uh, run the model. Um, if you don't or can't somehow manage to get a version of Internet Explorer, we are we just currently have managed to find the funding to create a new interface, but that will just take us a few months to get that up and running. And as soon as it is, we will update the link on the Impressions Project website. Well, thank you so much for your answers, Paul, and thank you to everyone who uh, asked questions. It's always great to have some discussion after the lecture. Um, David, do you have any um, comments or questions to wrap up on? Uh, yes, Jen, thanks for this wonderful, all-inclusive discussion, as the modeling is almost all-inclusive. So I guess the question I have, is there a population growth or demographics component to the model? Uh, I also noticed the assumption that, or an assumption that can be made, that agriculture will be preferenced when water availability is reduced. I think we're seeing in the Western US that population areas and their growth get, get favored as opposed to some of the agricultural locations, say in California. Yeah, so, so population um, is an input as part of the socioeconomic scenario. So then it's used in the sort of the urban model to sort of calculate demand for sort of housing and industry. It's used in the water model to calculate water demand. Um, and the sort of the water resources model also, as part of the scenario, you can define um, allocation. So you can have a an order of preference, whether you your population goes to um, domestic, um, industry, energy, uh, irrigation, and that can be again changed as part of the scenario parameters. So you can start to explore different um, ways of allocating water and what that actually means for land use. Yeah, it, it might be interesting at some point down the line to uh, try to estimate based on the impacts in these different sectors that the model is showing, to make population growth or demographics interactive with that. If there are gonna be a lot of fires and heat in, in a region, the population assumption for that region may need to be altered. Exactly, yeah. So that is also another big demand. So that's actually putting feedbacks into the model, which is similar to the, the Joel's question about putting the, the, the economic indicators in there more explicitly. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be great to do, it's just, a lot harder because it really slows down the model as well and uh, puts a lot of demands on it. But feedbacks is, is also a really important next, um, next, re next research step. Thank you again for this wonderful, enlightening talk. Actually, it seems like it's pretty far ahead in Europe compared to some other places. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to, to do the lecture. Great, so before wrapping up, I just want to read out a comment from Bill Travis, um, another author of the book who says, great to see land use change taken seriously as part of global change slash climate change. Some places that have tried to limit sprawl by policy, California, UK, now trying to expand housing, difficult to provide housing and limit sprawl and its environmental effects. Uh, so just to finish off, 
I don't know if Paul, you have anything in response to that and then I'll hand it back to Manishka. Um, well, no, just thank thank you, Bill, for supporting that. Uh, land, land use change has become a real big issue in the UK now because it's now seen almost as the centre of almost all sort of agricultural, environmental, climate policy all has to deal with the way we use land in the UK has to change because the current system is not sustainable in the long term. And it's great that that's actually being recognised. Thank you so much, uh, Paula. That was uh, a great talk and uh, a very interactive Q&A session. Uh, wonderful to have you today, Paula. And thank you, uh, David, Jen, and Joel for um, helping uh, with hosting and for participating in the Q&A session. Uh, let's just move very quickly through the wrap up because we do have a hard stop today. So on to the next slide, please, Jen. Uh, we pasted the link in the chat as well, so you can find the recordings at the NOAA CC Run website. And where we have some upcoming lectures that we uh, encourage you to sign up for. On to the next slide, please. So the, the ones on the right are the completed ones. You can access those recordings on the CC Run website. And then we have uh, two that are scheduled and a couple more in, in uh, upcoming in October as well. And uh, some of you have registered in advance, but some of these are new dates. So please do uh, visit that link to, to sign up for those. And to the next slide, please. This is once again, um, the book that these lectures are based off of. You can also get 30% off by using this code. And the objective of the book and the webinar series is to reach students, teachers, professionals, and all interested people across the world, especially in regions with limited resources. So we really hope that these resources will help to advance climate change education across the world. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Paula, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, thank you, David, Jen, and Joel. And thank you to all of you for participating today and see you in two weeks. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye.